we romanticized this whole idea that this part of this was going to suck. <laughs> like we hear everybody <laughs> talk about, oh yeah, you get a hundred pounds on your back. It's terrible. You know, but we, it's like in a way we said to ourselves, because we know it's going to be terrible, it's going to be fine. Right. And we didn't really realize that, no, it, it was, it was going to suck. Welcome to the Hunt Back Country podcast presented by Exo Mountain Gear. This podcast and the gear that we produce at Exo Mountain Gear share the same purpose to make you a more capable, confident, and successful backcountry hunter. Straight and to the point, no fluff, no BS. This show is all about providing you with valuable information from experienced hunters. To learn more about the podcast and our backcountry hunting packs, please visit exomountaingear.com. Well, welcome to episode 65. This is going to be a great one, guys. We are essentially interviewing you, or probably someone just like you. So we love getting the big names on the show and picking the brains of the experts, if you will. But this show is all about just a regular do-it-yourself hunter. The guest is Matt Gray. He's a Texas resident who hunted out of state on a western backpack elk hunt for the first time in 2016, and was fortunate enough to tag a bull. But even if he didn't, killing the bull isn't really why he's on this show. This show is all about what did Matt learn. So some things went great on Matt's trip, some things didn't go as planned. I just love hearing Matt's perspective as a new beginner, hearing about what gear issues he had, what lessons he found valuable, what information wasn't so valuable, how he prepared physically. So this is going to be incredibly helpful for you guys, especially if you are a newer hunter. We are just super excited to kind of cap this Beginner's Basics series we've been doing with this great discussion from Matt. Even if you're further along in your hunting journey, you're certainly going to be um, entertained, inspired, and probably still learn a thing or two from this episode. So we are excited that you guys are joining us for this one. In our conversation, Matt mentions a resource that he found incredibly valuable. And it's a resource that we've talked about before, months ago, really before the 2016 seasons kicked off. And that is the University of Elk Hunting online course from our friends at Elk 101. Just wanted to remind you guys to go check out this course. And in fact, if you do, you can save 40% by using the keyword backcountry, all one word, backcountry, the University of Elk Hunting online course. It is the most comprehensive and complete elk hunting resource ever. And that's the tagline that they use, but honestly, after reviewing it, after looking for elk hunting materials in my own journey over the past, you know, five plus years, it's absolutely true that this is the most comprehensive and complete resource. If I would have had this five years ago, oh man, I, I would have saved so much time in the research that I tried to gather and the lessons that I tried to learn because essentially it's a one-stop shop. So if you guys are interested in that and interested in growing as an elk hunter for 2017, go to elk101.com forward slash online course. You can use the keyword backcountry, again, all one word, and save 40% on that course. I know that that investment will pay off for you guys in the seasons to come. Also, one more thing, I feel like we're throwing a lot of things out there at you guys, but we want to welcome First Light as a sponsor and partner for this podcast. Steve and I have been using First Light's gear for years. Um, way back when we started using First Light, it was essentially only their merino wool layers, which we still use and love. But as you might know, First Light over the years has added outerwear pieces, rain gear, and other performance items to help you go farther and hunt longer. We are super excited about some of the pieces that First Light has come out with for 2017, including their new pattern, Cypher. If you guys haven't seen it yet, it is a great looking pattern, and we are excited to get it in the field. In fact, we have 2017 First Light gear on a FedEx truck headed to us right now, and can't wait to begin testing that and giving you guys feedback on what we're liking for the 2017 lineup. So big thanks to First Light. 
They are not only producers of amazing quality gear that helps us hunt more effectively, but they are true partners and advocates for conservation, and we just love everything that they stand for. All right, here's this week's show with Matt Gray. I know that you guys will enjoy this one. All right, guys, well, welcome to the podcast. Steve, how are you doing tonight? Uh, I'm doing fantastic. Yeah. And Matt, you are a listener who we flipped the script on you, and you are now being on the show. How are you doing, buddy? I'm doing great, doing great. We had nice warm weather here, 70 degree day in Texas. <laughs> Very nice, yeah. Kind of jealous of that. We actually got a touch of warmth this past weekend. It was phenomenal to get outside, but now it's cooling back off. So <laughs> you guys are lucky. It's like 16 degrees and a foot of snow in my yard. So. Do you still have all that snow hanging around, Steve? Yeah, it has not left. It's a crazy winter here. Have you guys got any more? It just hasn't been warm enough to kind of melt no, off. No, it was like four or five inches just today. Jeez. Yeah, it's you crazy. Guys getting hammered. Yeah, it's record I mean, for, snow here. for not being at elevation. <laughs> no goodness. Yeah, we're it's starting to get a little worried about how the how the elk and deer herds are going to do through this. No joke. Wow. Yeah, I heard it's getting a ton of snow up Tyler's way, too, up on the mountain. Yep. Yeah, dang. All right, well, Matt, um, so glad to have you on the show. I'm super excited about this one, um, excited to have you on. And, you know, just for the listeners, I mean, this is going to be a phenomenal show because we hear from so many guys who are in your shoes or, you know, are getting ready to make a trip like you have made this past year. Um but go, but you know, before we dive into specifics, just go ahead and give us context on a little bit of your hunting background, and then what led up to this trip last year. Where did you go? What did you hunt? Um, and what's your hunting history? Okay, sure. Um, yeah, let's see. Uh, I I started hunting since I was uh, very little. My dad here in Texas, uh, mostly whitetail hunting and and pigs and spring turkey and things like that. But uh, shoot, I. I've been in a deer stand, I guess, for um, as long as I can remember. Um, I did have a break away from it, though, in like late high school and college. I got into rodeo and like team roping, and it was kind of tough to do both. Um, but a few years ago when I got married, I kind of had to choose just one. <laughs> and uh, I chose hunting just because that was definitely my passion and and. Uh, uh, continue to whitetail hunt, um, different, you know, stuff that Texas has to offer. And, um, but I, I think it was about three years ago. Um, I had a buddy that, uh, from church that I met that, uh, had just come back. It was September and he had just come back from Colorado and was telling me about this horrible hunt he had <laughs> and how it's been his, his third year going and he still, uh, has hardly even seen an elk. But he can't wait to go again the next year. I was going to say, he, he was telling you about this horrible hunt that he can't wait to do next year. I'm sure that's exactly. how it goes. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and uh, how, so that kind of got the spark um, going in me and I started doing research. And yeah, about three years ago, I decided I wanted to go. And then I just, there was just, uh, we went to one income with me and my wife and I just didn't see it happening at that upcoming September. So I didn't buy any gear. I didn't do anything. And then here came September around and him and a few other guys were going and I just was going, Oh my gosh, you know, I, sh- I could have made it happen. And so then I said next year, you know what, I'm going to pick a date. And that was September, 2017 or 2016, excuse me. And, uh, I said, uh, I don't care what kind of gear I have, how good it is, how bad it is or what, but I, um, I'm going to go elk hunting. Uh, and I was planning on going to uh, Colorado over the counter units, but it almost didn't happen because we got ended up getting pregnant and, and, uh, we had our first, uh, baby girl in May that year. Oh, wow. So I thought that was going to wipe out my leave balance at work and, and yeah. things, but luckily I was able to make it work. And, and then I, that summer I had a few different partners that I was kind of juggling with that were supposed to be going with me and, and things just uh, didn't work out. And, and uh, me and Isaac uh, met that spring and started hanging out and shooting our bows together. And I just said, hey, you know what? You're um, twice my age, but you're in shape. And uh, <laughs> and uh, I'm going on this deal. And I know it's last minute notice, but would you want to go? Could you get all the gear together? And he said, I'll do it. And awesome. so, uh, so yeah, was it last just, September. It was just the two of you then? Yeah. 
It was just the two of us. Now we had uh, uh, two other guys that were kind of going with us from the same area, but we only were really even around each other like one once or twice, and and uh, we never really hunted together. And I gave them some of the spots I had kind of researched, and uh, but most time, you know, we didn't have service out there, and it was hard to, you know, coordinate anything and figure yeah. out where they were. Yeah. But uh, it, for the most part, it was me and Isaac. Right. So we, you know, we, you know, discussed back and forth, and uh, you know, you weren't asking to be on the show. I kind of asked you to be on the show once I heard your story, and then I asked you like, what are some of the things that you? found most helpful or would find most helpful to share with the listeners. And you sent me an awesome list of stuff. And on that list, since you mentioned it was hunting partners and you specifically said, you know, like when it comes to hunting partners, you need to make sure that you and your partner or, um, that you're equally prepared, have similar expectations. And then you even mentioned if you had gone on this trip with the original partner you were planning on that both you and that partner would have had a horrible hunt. So why would that have been a horrible hunt? And then why did going with Isaac work well? Kind of talk a little bit about the dynamics of partnership and what you learned on this first trip. Yeah. Well, I'm one, I'm thankful the way it worked out the way it did, uh, because me and Isaac just hunted great together. Um, but yeah, originally I had, uh, this one partner, um, who was very, not even very experienced in hunting period. Um, I, he had shot in just uh, one or two deer before, and, and uh, then just barely, I got him to pick up a bow that, uh, that fall before and let him shoot a buck that I was watching. So his first, his first animal with a bow ever was uh, about a 150-inch whitetail. Oh, nice. Uh, that, that was nice. But uh, I took him there to shoot a much smaller deer, and this came out. <laughs> um, he... Uh, he was uh, he was ahead of me in the family starting. He had a daughter who was turning two, and and he was a uh, he worked a lot. Uh, when he got home late, left super early in the morning, uh, so he he didn't have time to you know. I try to call him and and plan stuff and schedule stuff, or just say, hey man, I'm excited about this piece of gear. I've been researching this or looking at this, and you know he didn't have a whole lot of time to do that. And I I kind of was I got very passionate about it. Uh, very obsessive about research. I just loved it all, the whole process of planning and everything. And, and I'd get excited about it and, and he necessarily wasn't there. And then when I started trying to get in shape, the little that I did, he, um, he just didn't have time. And I think our intensity levels too, when it came to the actual hunt, my goal, even though I knew I was trying to keep it in check because I knew it was, I was a first time ever Western, um, over-the-counter tags and very popular units in Colorado um, that the chances of me getting an elk were extremely small, but I was dead set. You know, I always heard the rule about uh, that uh, 90% of the elk are killed by 10% of the hunters. And I said, I want to be in the 10%. And so I was very intense about it and he wasn't. And so I feel if, if we would have actually hunted together, um, he wouldn't have been able to keep up. I wouldn't have been able to go some of the places that I wanted to go. Uh, it, it just, the chemistry wouldn't have worked out. And yeah. so it, it was kind of a godsend that, that, that fell through in a way and that um, me and Isaac got um, paired up together uh, cause we were perfect. Yeah. So, Do you feel uh physical fitness played a big role in your hunt? Oh, huge, <laughs> huge, uh, yeah. especially into, uh, uh, the enjoyment of the hunt. Uh, mm. I think a lot of it too, is we romanticized at, at listening to all these podcasts like this one, all these YouTube channels and seeing all these very experienced, uh, people that, that live out there in the West, like you do, Steve, and they get to do this all the time and live in the mountains. And we, we live in Hills, but it's still nothing like, uh, up there and no elevation to speak of. Um, we romanticized this whole idea that this part of this was going to (laughs) suck. Like we hear everybody (laughs) talk about, Oh yeah, you get a hundred pounds on your back. It's terrible. You know, (laughs) it's like in a way we said to ourselves, because we know it's going to be terrible. It's going to be fine. Right. And we didn't really realize that. No, it it was, it was going to suck. Genuinely terrible. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, definitely terrible. And I'd like to say our first day, for example, our first day actually hunting, um, 
oh, we gassed ourselves. We we thought that we could go anywhere, do anything. We dropped down into some drop down, lost serious elevation at times, just to have to gain them back to go back to where we were. Mm-hmm. And and like we gassed ourselves so much on the first day that uh, we had to take almost a whole day off just because yeah. we weren't ready for that. And uh, we we didn't really know what we were doing. And so even though that was a it was great for me and Isaac to be on the same page when it came to our physical fitness um, and intensity of the hunt, we still want to be much more prepared next year. <laughs> yeah. I was just going to ask, uh, what are, what are some of the things you did to prepare? Was it kind of like, you know, just going for runs, things like that? Were you lifting? And then how are you going to prepare, you know, differently this year yeah. physically? Okay. Um, I guess now that I think about it, it was very mild. I, uh, I, I, walk with my wife and the baby around the block a few times with a pack and I put, you know, 50 pounds in it or something. And, and, uh, uh, I maybe occasionally me and Isaac would go somewhere and do a couple of miler, but still around here, the most elevation gain and loss we can get is 50 or 60 feet, uh, normally. And it was nothing that was ever really intense. No, no, no program, nothing telling us to push it even harder. And because we didn't really know what to expect, we didn't know to push it even farther. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. But, but this next year, we are definitely going to try to be more prepared. Um, uh, Isaac and his wife, uh, they work out a whole lot. And so he's changed the way he works out to be uh, a much quicker pace stuff, more. Isaac, what kind of stuff are you doing? Well, I, I mean, we, we weight train, uh, you know, several days a week, but, you know, we've, we've set days aside that are set just mainly for cardio and, uh, you know, just putting miles on our feet when we can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we, we learned, you know, what I learned from the, from that hunt was, is that, uh, you know, the reality the reality was is is going in there in public land and uh to to take an animal that's under the pressure that that they are uh there's a price to pay and um you know you got to go back in there and uh it's just it was a little suffer fest (laughs) to, to, to get the prize but the moment that we that we got back after uh experiencing that you know um I've started training for the next hunt after I had recuperated uh, from our first trip. And um, we don't want to be in as much pain as we did last year. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I know I, myself, I, I started, uh, there's a local CrossFit gym and, and I don't, a lot of your listeners may be able to relate to this some, but I've come from one income, young family. I'm only, uh, I guess about to be 26 here. And, uh, I mean, I, it's, I just have to scrape by just to get my, uh, hunting gear. You know, I got plenty of other stuff that my income needs to go to first. Yeah. And mm-hmm. so especially like gym memberships or buying a lot of new gear is it's, it's tough to whittle that money away to be doing that. So, uh, if I could, I'd have a membership at like a CrossFit gym, something I knew would kick my butt, mm-hmm. <laughs> but, uh, I've, I follow a local CrossFit gym, post their workouts, and I live close to our local high school here in Heiko, and uh, uh, we can go over there, and, and I'll try to follow those workouts and, and things. And I've only been doing this now for maybe two months, and I feel so much more prepared even right now than I did um, last year. And then also we're going to be incorporating more stuff, uh, like you all mentioned on a recent podcast, about getting more um, – sport oriented mm-hmm. towards uh come later in the summer uh and then also we have a we've never done it before and i think it's pretty new to texas but a, a train to hunt event yeah mm-hmm. is gonna be here in april only about two hours from us and so uh um we're planning on going to that seeing how that is and, and that's kind of our motivation right now um is to, awesome. to try to get in shape for that yeah that's great that's sweet yeah, I was going to say earlier that uh, I like how you said that uh, being in, in shape wasn't a, a, you know, a key factor in being success, but it made a lot more enjoyable. And I think that's a yeah. good 
a good viewpoint from it is, uh, yeah. do you have to be freaking Cameron Haynes running up and down the mountains to be successful? Absolutely not. But the better shape you are and the more prepared, it's just going to make the hunt and the experience, you know, just that much better. Right. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And it's not about like, as you guys find out, you can get burned out the first day. And what I found is like being in shape is, is good for whatever, like on the pack end, it really doesn't matter. Cause you're all amped up. It's like day seven. Like, do you still have anything left into the tank? And as much as, I mean, so much of that's, you know, physical and mental, like mentally, are you prepared? And for me, like the mental aspect of training and going through, you know, moments that suck in my physical training is as much about that mental strength as it is the physical strength. Um, something you even mentioned was how you realized essentially how mentally weak you were on this trip. Um, kind of go into that. And then you also mentioned that next year you're going to be more comfortable being uncomfortable. So this whole like mental strength, get comfortable with being uncomfortable, like kind of walk us through some of those lessons learned there. Okay, absolutely. Um, and I think this is a very important point for anybody like myself that, that does not live out west and is coming there. And especially like us, if you haven't spent a whole lot of time there besides the occasional like vacation, but actually like in the mountains at elevation um, without all the niceties of life, um, is most of the hunting we do here in Texas is not that intense. Uh, in fact, like most of the whitetail hunting I did, I, a buddy let me set up a stand five miles from my house. So it's not that intense if I get cold. And you don't if have I get to hike those five miles, right? <laughs> I do not. Yep. I can, drive the truck. About, I can drive about 200 yards from my stand. And, <laughs> and, uh, and if something gets uncomfortable, I can drive back home. Right. And, uh, so, and I think too, like with the romanticizing idea of Western hunting being hard is that I didn't realize how big of a mental factor there would be. So as soon as I got uncomfortable, it didn't take much for me to start, start saying, oh man, you know, there, there was a nice restaurant back at that town we passed, you know, it sure <laughs> would be nice to go down there and get something to eat or, or uh, maybe we should take a break and go get a hotel room one night or something um, and especially I ended up, uh, it, it was my first trip over the counter, uh, do it ourselves in Colorado. And, and on the third day of our trip, I, early in the morning, uh, I shot a little bull. Um, and so that was amazing, but especially after we packed that bull out to our truck, um, we, that was a just absolutely grueling deal. We actually did it in one trip, which I don't think we'll ever try to do that again. <laughs> and, uh, uh, that it just hurt us so bad that, that really the entire rest of the trip, we didn't hunt that hard. Um, we, we pretty like, we'd get up on ridges and we'd pretty much say, we have to be see an elk way down there or else we're not going. When, or it has to come you know, to the us first or second of day, <laughs> we would have jumped off in there. Right. Um, and I know also too, for, like the day after we, the day or the night I shot my bull, we had a horrible night on the mountain. Uh, we nicknamed it the hell night. And in that next morning after that experience, hiking back to where we had left our camp, where I shot the bull. Um, I remember I was even telling Isaac, we're only halfway through our trip. And I said, dude, next year, how about we'll just get you a tag. Let's just go home right now. You know, my wife has already been texting me saying that she's having a little bit of trouble with our, our four month old at the time. And I just, I was ready to get off the mountain. I was done. And, uh, as my, even though I spent years waiting for that moment, uh, it was amazing. It was surprising how quickly I actually changed and said, I'm ready to get off this mountain. I'm ready to go home. Uh, and I was, yeah, telling Isaac, you know, saying, Hey, we'll make a deal. We'll cut, we'll just get you a tag next year. We'll come hunt for you. Let's just go home now. And, and things, we ended up sleeping it off and, and stayed the rest of the week. But like I said, we didn't hunt anywhere near as hard the whole rest mm -hmm. of the week. Cause we, we were toast. Yeah. But man, that mental game is so huge. And I'll say that it, it doesn't go away. Like it, it gets easier. But even like for me, you know, when I'm, you know, thousands of miles away and like this year, for example, I think it was on the 
third or fourth day, we pretty much didn't have cell service anywhere. And I, I got a bit of cell service and talked to my wife, which you think would be very uplifting. But then it was also a time when my kids were home. And when I got off the phone from, like, talking to my eight-year-old, and he was like, Daddy, are you coming home yet? And it was, like, only the third or fourth day. I was like, oh, my gosh. Like, what are we do? Like, it was one of those times where the hunting was slow. The animals weren't there. You know, we're so far away. And it was like, oh, it would be so easy to walk away. But you just have to stand it and stay mentally yeah. engaged and fight through it. And, you know, as it turns out, like, in this hunt, I mean, three days later, literally with an hour of daylight left in our week long hunting, I shot my bull. So that just like goes to show you if you're out there, you're always going to have like those moments. But I would say just like take that moment for what it is. And like, almost like you said, just sleep on it because tomorrow you might feel 180 degrees different. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And then the, 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 where I said that next year I want to be um, better at being um, more comfortable. I think I, that kind of came from something I heard, uh, like Tim Burnett say, I'm thinking solo hunter. Um, and is, yeah, there were so many moments, especially being somebody, I had a lot of used gear, a lot of very cheap gear. Uh, my, my boots ended up being horrible. The one thing that I spent, <laughs> actually spent money on failed me miserably. Oh, uh, man. and my pack, I, I went with a cheap pack. It's all I could get. And, and, uh, it was I th everything through my pre like getting ready for the trip. I thought it'd be okay. Starting out the trip, it was okay. But man, when that weight hit it, uh, with all the meat, uh, <laughs> it, it changed and, uh, shoot, even Isaac's pack broke on him on our way back about, we had about one mile left and his oh. frame started coming out of his. And so we, I have pictures of him walking down to his back, the last stretch to our truck and all the meats just hanging off to one side, <laughs> and, oh my but he's just so ready to get back. He doesn't even want me to adjust it. He's just going back. But with, with our change in intensity of what we're trying to do to prepare for next year physically, um, that I believe has helped me big time, um, learn to be okay with being uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and then also I've had some later hunts this year here in Texas that we've actually had two cold spells, uh, big time cold spells here. And like, I know I was hunting kind of in the panhandle in December and I've never hunted in temperatures like this. I've never even hunted in the snow, but it was like eight degrees and, uh, snowing and I was whitetail hunting and just being able to stick with that, like just saying, no, this is just like the oak hunt. I know I can drive home. I know this is miserable, but I need to teach myself that this is okay. Mm -hmm. And, and to kind of, yes, I want to go home. Um, but this is what I've been waiting for all week at work. This is what I was thinking about. You know, this is, I want to be here and I need to stay here. Uh, and just, I try to look for things throughout and I'm going to throughout this whole year to remind me of that. So that next year, uh, you know, I'll be going with a, a lot of the same gear. I'm, I'm hopefully going to be upgrading my pack this year is about the only thing I'm planning on changing. Well, I guess in my boots, but everything else is going to be the same most likely. So there's still going to be some aspects of if I'm going to do this with some budget gear, I'm not going to be as comfortable as guys that have all the nice stuff. And, hmm. Just knowing that initially, uh, I think will help. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's so good what you said about just taking every moment, like whether that's your late season hunt now or just whatever other opportunity where conditions suck and just embracing that. Um, yep. I mean, it's almost like you just have to make a game out of it. Like, yeah, it's cold. Yeah, I'm uncomfortable. But guess what? How long can I stay out here? Because I'm not dying. Yeah. I'm not actually getting frostbite. I'm not actually getting hypothermia. I'm fine. I can walk away if something gets serious. So let's just embrace this for what it is and, and get a little bit tougher. I think it's so good. Yep. So I would love to hear on the boots. I'm not asking you to name names. I mean, you can. We don't really care. Because boots, like, the thing is with boots especially is your boots could have been phenomenal boots that someone else is in love with and they just didn't fit your feet right. Therefore, they weren't good boots for you. I mean, boots are so personal. But... Did you think going into the hunt that your boots were good? Like, did you, you know, do train yes. hikes and things like uh, them? Like, how are you going to evaluate boots differently now? So what, yeah, exactly like you said about people's feet being different. I had gotten in my head from listening to another popular podcast that, that I needed a very stiff boot. 
<laughs> and so I went to REI. I bought the uh, bottom of the line uh, Loas that I could get, and I loved them. I even and when I when I tried them on there, the the gentleman there that helped me buy them, um, you know, even I was gonna buy a size smaller, and he even showed me how I needed to buy another size bigger because my toes might hit the front when I'm going down going hills down, and yeah. things. And I used them all summer. I used them working some to break them in. We used them on these hikes. I thought they were fantastic. I used them spring turkey hunting and a lot of wet, wet, wet grass. And my feet were dry the whole time. I loved them. So I didn't plan on bringing any sort of backups on the trip. Mm -hmm. Uh, Shoot, if I would have even brought tennis shoes, I probably would have brought out my tennis shoes and gone in those the rest of the trip. But um, I learned that... uh, I'm not sure exactly how this happened and why it happened there and nowhere else, but I really feel like my boots shrunk on me like the second day to where every, every time I was going downhill, my toes were jamming in the front. And anytime I was going uphill, my heels were just bearing into that, the, the stiff heel support of the boot, not really mm-hmm. like a blister type of pain, but just a, like a bruising type. Yeah. Like a pressure. And it, Yes, and it just made the hunt miserable. I tried lacing my boots all sorts of different ways that I had seen on videos and things, and and nothing would relieve it. And so that was a major factor, too, not just our not being prepared enough that we'd like to be uh, last year in, in our enjoyment of the hunt, but my feet hurt the whole time. And so that that just ruins stuff. Uh, I mean, that's what you're living on out there is your feet and – uh, so next year, I believe I'm actually going to be buying a cheaper boot that Isaac brought and and was fine with. And I remember even telling him that all oh, the you know those are too cheap; they're going to fail on you; they're going to be bad. But uh, he loved them and he's still using them. And so I'm probably going to get those next year. And I'm gonna I'm gonna bring some sort of backup boot in case those don't work out and leave it in the truck. But uh, yeah, that was a, a crucial point that, that failed on me on my first trip. And that's there's a lot of things. Um, and like I think the reason why I reached out to you in that email is that me coming from my first experience, it, it's great listening to people who do this all the time and who are experts. Like I got the only reason I was able to kill an elk this year is because of what I learned from y'all interviewing those type of people. But it was things like that that I didn't necessarily know. Uh, I didn't know really how altitude was going to affect me. I didn't know. For example, I tried to, there's a lot of people out there talking about, um, you know, very health conscious talking about how you need to eat very healthy when you're back in the back country. You don't want to be eating, you know, mountain houses and all this other stuff. It's got too much sodium and how they feel that they don't hunt well or don't feel as well if they're not eating like, stuff that they make themselves. So I uh-huh. jumped on board and I said, I got a dehydrator. I'll start trying to do my own stuff. Well, I had no idea that stuff does not dehydrate the same at whatever elevation I am here in Texas and at 11,000 feet. It doesn't. And uh-huh. so most of my meals that I packed that were, that I tested here and were delicious here, like I make some deer spaghetti, uh, some chili, some different noodle things they literally did not dehydrate at 11,000 feet. I'd even have it in a jet boil for like 20, 30 minutes, and there would still be aspects of it that were hard, some was soft, and it was horrible. And so then I kept trying to bum Isaac's mountain houses off of him. <laughs> and so it was just like little things like that, like my, my feet hurting, my food not being what I planned, uh, my pack not being what I thought it was, sl- like slowly added up to, to me being – uh, very uncomfortable. Yeah. I was going to say yeah. like when you're out there for days on end and food sucks and your feet hurt, those are by no means little things like that no. adds up to being horrible. <laughs> and then like, uh, <laughs> yeah. the elevation, I don't know if it was excitement elevation or what, but, uh, um, uh, we hardly slept almost the whole time. It was probably not until the fourth or fifth day that we actually slept. Well, uh, our first mm-hmm. night, I think it was elevation and we tried to sleep in the back of my truck, which was a terrible idea. Cause it was so cold. We should have just slept on the ground, even though it was wet. Mm-hmm. Uh, we hardly slept that night, and we, we got horrible headaches from the elevation. Uh, 
The second night, we tried to sleep the same deal back in the truck. And then the next day, we decided to go back into the spot where we had seen a bull on our first day or a elk our first day. But he was in a horrible spot. And I actually, when we came out of there our first day, we said, hey, that was cool. There was elk there, but we're not going back <laughs> because it was too hard. That if There's no way if we killed an animal down there, we could get it back to the truck. Well, I get back to my truck and it doesn't start. So... We had planned on sleeping in that next day, taking a break, and go checking out some other areas, my plant B's and C's and so on, before we came back to this spot to see if there was an easier place that we could kill an elk. Well, the truck didn't start. So I said, well, we're here. We might as well go back. So the end of our second day, we decided to hike our way back in there, and we slept in there that night. And we had... The reason we didn't sleep, sleep that night was a very good reason. We actually had elk everywhere all night long, bugling so close to us. I would pull out my phone and just record them. Mm-hmm. Uh, as, I mean, I bet we had a bull. We believe he was the biggest one around. We never actually laid our eyes on him. But for majority of the night, he was about 50 yards from us, just bugling, raking, stomping around in the mud, uh, it was an awesome experience. And we also felt super lucky because I know so many guys that have been doing this that even gave me advice and have hardly even seen an elk on one of these trips, much less heard a bugle. And we were right in the middle of them. Uh, it was, so that was pretty neat, but we hardly slept that night. Uh, our third night, the story on that one is we, um, we packed the elk out. Our partner, the other guys met us, took us to town so I could get my truck fixed. But we decided we could come back a different way and try to get back up there to where our camp was before dark. Well, the long story short of that is those guys were nowhere near as prepared as we were to hike. And in what would have taken me and Isaac half of our time to get up there before dark, we only covered about three quarters of a mile. Mm. So here it is dark. We have three miles to go and about 2,200 feet of elevation to go up. <laughs> And we all our gear still up there because all we did was pack out the meat. I had the little flashlight that was left on my keychain for my truck. Oh, we didn't no. have warm clothes. We did have water though. So like and all of your gear, like your headlamp, all, your all right, the layers. Yeah. If we could have done it again, we would have realized, hey, it's only about two hours till dark. Let's just stay here. Yeah. Make do with whatever we got in the truck and going in the morning. But we thought, no, we can get there. Yeah. We got a good trail for about half the way, and then we got to go through the woods for about two miles. Well, here we get to the end of this trail. It was probably 1130 at night, and we realize our flashlights, my battery's dying, and there's no way we're going to go through this thick, dark timber. I mean, there was deadfall everywhere. We just knew if we would have tried to make it to camp, uh, we would have got hurt. And so then we're like, well, okay, so we're three miles from the truck. We're mile two miles from our camp what do we do yeah (laughs) and we got nothing and so we ended up scrounging up a fire and just laid there around the fire which for a texas boy who doesn't ever have to do that all the time uh and if you don't know this it's really hard to light a fire at ten thousand foot it just it doesn't stay lit (laughs) yeah and uh so we were huddling around this fire trying to stay warm. We didn't sleep at all that night. It started raining on us because we didn't make it in any, any sort of cover. We just wanted to be warm. I remember one of the things I did spend money as, on is I bought some used uh, Sitka clothes. That's one of the things I did have that worked great. But um, I got holes all in that from the embers from that night being close to the <laughs> For fire. For being so close, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so that stuff toast now. And uh and so that night was horrible. We didn't sleep that night either. And so the next morning, go you, ahead. you referred earlier to a hell night. I'm hoping it was this night and you didn't have another that night that was hellish. Okay, good. I was just making sure there was like some other crazy story that this was the that hell was night. It. Yeah. No, it was, uh, um, and for, I've, I mean, I guess if we would have, if we had been more experienced backcountry hunters, a night like that probably wouldn't have been that bad. But that was so foreign to us, you know, uh, uh, another thing we're not used to, I mean, both of us feel like we're pretty comfortable out in the woods down here at night, right? Well, where we were staying there, where we were in the mess of the elk was in the darkest, nastiest timber with, it was wet everywhere. It was the creepiest 
forest in the world. Like <laughs> both of us were creeped out the whole time. Like we loved being there because there was elk everywhere. And most of the time we'd be almost gagging because it smelled like elk so bad. And we'd be like, this is awesome. But this is the creepiest place on earth. <laughs> Just spend the night. <laughs> and, yeah. Yeah. And what's also like, we got noise at night. We got bugs and birds making noise. It was absolutely silent. Uh -huh. And that was weird. Yeah. Like we didn't know about that. And, and there were so many little things like that, that, that took away from what we were expecting. Yeah. Now I know probably in this podcast or this interview, we've been very negative, but we still, I wouldn't say you're negative. I would say you're being realistic. No. Or be okay. Yes, like we can't <laughs> wait to go back next year. But when we were packing that elk out, and we were about a mile away from the truck, we literally told each other, "You know, this was awesome, but maybe this was like a cool thing we did once. Like we've been there, done that. Let's Check. try something else." <laughs> yeah. But uh, it's addicting, uh, and all the time too when we get back, and our whole town was wondering how we did, and getting to share some of the elk meat around, and. And always saying, you know, this was the hardest meat I have ever gotten in my life, <laughs> you <Yeah>. know, <laughs> but it, it made it all worth it. So, That's awesome. Hey, Mark, uh -huh. um, what would be your suggestion on for, for, for you guys here, like getting boots and actually testing them before you went? You know, for me, it's easy. If I, I buy a new pair of boots, I put pack weight in the pack and go hike four or five miles up in the mountains. Yeah. Uh, but how do you how do you do that? In, you know, Midwest and Texas where it's flat and I mean, you really need to get on uneven terrain. How do you right. test that and break them in? Yeah. I mean, a huge factor there is where you are purchasing the boots and what their return policy looks like. Um, <laughs> you know, yeah. because a, a ton of places are like, yeah, no problem. You can wear them around the house, but you can't go out and, you know, really get them dirty or show any signs of wear. So mm -hmm. a, if you're purchasing, purchasing them from a place like that, I literally load my pack up with weight and like start doing stairs, like up and down from the basement, start doing stairs, start doing stairs, like side footed, start stepping on stuff that's uneven, like start flexing, like, you know, put your toe up on something higher and see how your heel responds. Does it slide? Does it slip? Does it lock in? So literally like around the house, again, this is depend on, you know, that type of return policy, do those things and do them weighted. And don't just, like I said, do them like off footed and with weird angles and stuff like that. Um, definitely see how your foot responds, um, to going down. And then I would say, try and wear them a lot. Even if this is around the house, try and wear them a lot and just flat out be on your feet a lot. Because I think there's a difference between putting a boot on and walking around for 10 minutes or 15 minutes. But if you can like be on your feet for two hours, even if you're just walking around the house, but you can be on your feet for two hours, your feet or you know, sometimes even at that point in time, they begin to swell, they begin to change. And so I think that can be incredibly helpful. Now, like some places like REI that you mentioned, they're more a bit more liberal in the return policy. And, you know, even if you get out and go outside um, and they flat out don't work, they can work with you on an exchange or what have you. Um, if you pay the $20. Right. Yeah. Like if you're a member. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, which, in the, which I did not do. Yeah, and in the long run, <laughs> even if you don't shop at REI, personally, I think it is worth it because it's like a one-time, you're in for a life deal, yeah. and they do treat you pretty well. Um, and then yeah. some REIs, too, also have, like I know that mine does, they have like this big rock formation thing you can crawl around inside to try and mm -hmm. go up and down and get on, you know, off-level footing, things like that. So that can be helpful. But yeah, essentially just as much time as you can on your feet even if it isn't ideal scenarios, just spend time on your feet and do it with weight. It, but I mean, even then I found like, it's almost like you said, um, with your trip is like, what happened to my feet? They were fine. Like I've just found that my feet feel different some days, which is weird. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it is, I, I'll be honest, like that's one of the toughest things, um, yeah. to do is to fit boots and to fit them well. And, there's good info out there. Uh, I think you even mentioned, Matt, there are like different lacing techniques. There's different, you know, strategies, things like that. Um, if you guys are super serious about boots, you know, the listeners, I, going back to a previous episode, we did a, a an episode with uh, Lathrop and Sons. They're out in the Midwest, but essentially specialize in hunting boots for Western and mountain hunting. And if nothing else, just flat out talk to them because they will provide you with a, at least a very good starting point. I mean, you can 
you can go as far as like having them send out stuff to custom mold your feet. Like I'm not saying you need to go that far. Maybe you can if you have the money to do that. But if nothing else, call them up and talk with them and they'll be happy to at least help you get started in the right direction. But yeah, it, it is tough for sure. Yeah. I think what we went wrong too is that is I didn't, I, we were way too mild in how I did test my boots uh, yeah, and I mean, my was, pack. Yeah, like when you said going for walks on your wife, it's like, or on your wife. God, don't walk on your wife with your boots. <laughs> going for walks yeah. with your wife. Like, yeah, pushing around the neighborhood, that's time on your feet and good. But, yeah, essentially, like, you want to try and to get into some terrain. And even just, like, I would say this. For guys who are in the Midwest or out east, and this just isn't about fitting boots. It could be about training. It could be about whatever. There's a hill around you somewhere. And, like, guys get in this mode of, like, oh, I want to go, you know, do a training hike, and I want to try and get elevation. And what they'll do is they'll go hike this three-mile trail that has, like, one good hill on it. But they'll do the whole three miles where most of it's flat and there's one good hill. And what I do, and this is mind-numbingly boring, but go find the biggest, gnarliest hill and just just do that. Instead of hiking, you know, three or four miles for an hour, hour and a half or whatever, just hike that one hill for like an hour or an hour and a half. It's boring, but it's effective. Yeah. So if you have to do it, do it. Yeah. I would recommend if I was in Matt in your shoes, I would, yeah, do everything Mark said. And then once you decide on a pair of boots, I would go for the the longest hike you is, you could think possible, you know, five miles, 10 miles, something like that. Cause you're going to, we've said it in the last two beginner basic episodes of of boots and packs are the two things you don't want to mess with. And it sounds like you, got unfortunately unlucky on both of those yeah yeah so your your pack out matt with the elk that was like about four ish miles what sounds like somewhere on there three and a half yeah three Three and a half and we let's see it was uh from where our truck was or we had to go um up about eight or nine hundred foot that was the hardest it was a that was probably over a quarter mile maybe Uh like it was so steep. Yeah. We had trouble getting down it, much less going back up it. And uh, there was no good way, other way around it besides just going straight up. Um, and then it was probably only a few hundred feet here or there for another mile, mile and a half. And then it was downhill about um, 2,000, 2,500 feet mm-hmm. uh, back down to the truck. And yeah, it, and you know, even though I thought I'd be ready for it by putting, you know, 50 to 100 pounds in my pack every once in a while, you know, I, I never did anything that was for that long and for that intense mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. not any close, not anywhere close. But, yeah, yeah, it was it was a suffer fest. So yeah. what, what went into the decision to pack the elk out in one trip between the two of you? I guess we thought that uh, it wasn't going to be as bad as it ended up being. <laughs> yes, yeah, and then we thought, if you know what, if it gets bad, well, at least we'll get him. We'll get all of our um, everything, all the meat we we're taking. We'll get at least up that eight hundred foot. Yeah, and then we can drop weight there. Well, then once we got there, we went. That was horrible, and we took a long break. But we thought, you know what, the rest of this will be a lot easier. And then so each section would go, I guess we kept doing that. And then it got to a point just where we were so miserable, we did yeah. not want to turn around to have to come back. Mm-hmm. So we just kept with it and kept going. Mm-hmm. But but I know like next year um, uh, when Isaac gets him, him a bull, um, we plan on just enjoying that more. Uh, we turned it into the worst it could and what we feel it could have been. We made it as miserable as it could have been trying to do one pack out. Um, we, we tried to rush it that my elk died, uh, right in the sun. And so we, we try to get everything, uh, quartered and off the bone as quick as we could. But now that we think about it, we could have taken more time, uh, Mm -hmm. and spread it out. We could have done two trips. There's a lot of things that next year we plan on doing next year. Should we want to sit down and eat some of it before we even leave, you know, kind of enjoy that little deal. Um, have some tenderloin or something, but uh, we're definitely going to be planning our pack out much different this next year. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 The, the first elk that uh, my hunting partner and I killed, uh, he shot the bull and we, we did the same thing. We packed it out uh, in one trip and it was, it was about, it was really close to six miles, like 5.85 or something. He had it tracked and 
we don't want to do it again. It was pretty brutal. Pretty stinking brutal. Yeah, I think the trip took us uh, with with just our gear uh, going in was about an hour and a half uh, when uh, we put our packs on with the meat and headed back to the truck. It, it was a, about a five and a half hour ordeal. Mm. You know, so, uh, a little bit we were, as he- we were twice as heavy then right right you yeah know, uh, I, I was that I was just lucky in my choice of boots though they uh, they held together and they were everything that I could have wanted them to be matter of fact since since then I now have I think what three three pair uh, <laughs> yeah <laughs> I have three pair of, of, of of the same brand. Uh, and what are they, Isaac? There's I, I, the boots that I took were Solomon. I think they were like a GTX four or something like that. Oh, like the Quest Four D. Yeah. 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 Uh-huh. That's what I wore this yeah. past year. Uh-huh. And, uh huh. And and the I mean we we were constantly wet and crossing through creeks and uh, through meadows and stuff like that. And with I think I had some Kentex uh, gaiters, but dude. I, my the inside of my boot, even right now, it looks just as new as it did the day that I bought them. Um, hmm. They seem to wick moisture out from sweat, and they didn't. Uh, they never got wet from the outside in. Mm-hmm. Huh? And I passed over those because I, I don't know for somewhere I got in this idea that that they were too cheap, they wouldn't work, and that, hmm. that they would leak like a sieve because they had so much stitching and stuff going on, and that they weren't stiff enough. Well, if I could after, and now learning, listening to even more podcasts since the hunt, shoot, I'd go with a trail runner if I could, if it would work with packing out a hundred pounds. But Mm -hmm. so now I'm trying to wear, I learned that my feet need a, an extremely flexible boot Mm -hmm. and I don't want a lot of ankle support. Um, just the minimum that I need. And so I'm going to be trying the Solomon's next year. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a great choice. I mean, I I run Solomon XA Pro 3Ds and in their uh, Ultras, which they're just trail running shoes, and that's what I hunt with, and I absolutely love them. Um, and if yeah, if you can get away with it, ankle support wise, I, I mean, I haven't had a blister in I don't know what decade. I mean, we, <laughs> it's uh, I'm a huge huge fan of it. I'm not quite sure why everybody thinks you need a really stiff boot and why that perception's out there. I'm sure for some guys it works, but I think the vast majority of guys would be much better off and more comfortable with a, you know, a more flexible shoe, basically like what Solomon makes. Absolutely. So uh, this is going to be a loaded question, I'm sure. And, and, you know, we're getting far along in the podcast, so we can't spend an hour on it, although I'm sure that we could, but what is, so like, Killing the Elk, Matt, and you kind of even mentioned like, you know, podcasts and other resources helped you do that. There's so much information out there in terms of like hunting tactics, tips, calling strategies, like you, you know, scouting, like you name it. There's so much. But as you look back, what are like two or three things that helped you the most to actually, you know, not backpack, not pack in, not do camp, not do gear, but actually kill an elk? actually kill an elk uh, golly uh, that, would, that would have to be um, like this podcast uh, thing like listening to all the people y'all have interviewed um, I really enjoyed I got a subscription to that the elk hunting university Oh, with Corey? Nice. Yeah, with Corey. A uh, lot of that. Uh, I have probably, like if, if you were to pull up my YouTube account and search for archery elk hunting, you'd probably have to go 10 pages before you found one I hadn't watched. Uh, so <laughs> I definitely immersed myself in in all sorts of different styles and tactics. Uh, and think, Now, we definitely had, we were planning on doing it more of Corey Jacobson's style. Uh, but I don't know if we just weren't there calling wise or what the lapse was, but in our hunt, uh, we definitely wish we would have been more mild on our bugling. Uh, we, we wished we would have toned that back 
use the cow call maybe more or maybe even not call, uh, picked raking over any calling whatsoever. Um, I would like, I would like to say that Google earth for Matt, because he was pretty much the navigator. Um, he, his research and what he found with Google earth, uh, really helped put us, uh, in the area where the elk were. Now, that being said, uh, with the experience of have been there and done that and being able to go back at Google Earth and look at the areas that we had gone into, Matt especially is really, uh, can really pick, uh, pick out more or better elk sign on on yeah. Google Earth now than what we could before. Just being able to, you know, he really can see what it is that we were looking at, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was at Google Earth. Yeah, really, that had to be the almost, even though it's, I guess, not necessarily hunting tactic, I feel that that our where we are going to go next year, we're honestly placing more of an emphasis on that than almost even how we're going to kill one because mm -hmm. We learned that I think it's definitely true, at least in the area we were hunting, there was hunters everywhere. Every trailhead had so many trucks, so many people. Um, that first few days, we found a spot to ourselves. And that first spot that I researched very heavily, I did have some backup plans, but that first spot, it, there was elk everywhere. And I felt so lucky that I was one of the few guys ever that has gone on their first elk hunt, planted themselves, and their first spot is an elk heaven. Like, uh, I'm <laughs> sure rare. that's extreme. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, very, very rare. But so what we were able to do the rest of the trip, we went to more mild areas. Um, after we packed out my bull and we stayed in there a few days, but uh, some other hunters moved in and, and we were close to some private land and all the elk kind of pushed off into the private land. Um, but what I was able to do from that, from when we left the hunt is, in combination of gaining more knowledge, listening to more podcasts, um, things like that, uh, question and answer videos on YouTube, um, I was able to seriously look at that area that we found elk in and, and ask myself, what was it about that one spot that held elk there when everywhere else that we went, we didn't even see hardly any sign of elk. And I've actually learned that, uh, like a lot of the wallows we saw in person, um, I can see them on Google Earth. <laughs> and I learned what elk, like kind of what, uh, what kind of tree line look that, that the elk seem to be held in. Uh, and then I learned that I think they really like that area because if the pressure did go up, they could scoot off into private land and be safe. So they were comfortable being there until pressure did move them away mm -hmm. um yeah they had so much plenty sense. of oh yeah they had plenty of area to hide it was that you could not have snuck up on an elk in this dark timber forest we were we were just below tree line um from a very steep incline and then it kind of well i say leveled out it was still you know dropping four or five hundred feet over about a mile of kind of some rolling stuff but there was so much deadfall that there's no way you could have snuck up on an elk. So we knew that they were very comfortable being in there because nobody could sneak up on them. They hear you. Um, but they were everywhere. And then I've also found that, that um, what you, Steve, and Lenny have talked about, you've answered a few times when people ask, like, if it's okay to camp in the mm -hmm. elk. We mm -hmm. agree. Like, that is absolutely what happened to us. They did not care. They were all around us. We, that third morning... We were sitting there waiting on the sun to come up because we had elk bugling everywhere. And that one that spent all night by us just moved right up on this ridge right above us, about 200 yards or so. And we thought, you know what? As soon as it gets shooting light, we'll hammer him with a challenge bugle. And we're in his house. Like, he cannot help but come down here. He's going to have to, right? That's what all the tactics told us. Well, so I moved ahead a little bit. Isaac literally was at our tent. <laughs> And I was only about 30 yards from where our tent was. And I wanted to get closer, but there were so many cows coming to him and working their way up this ridge, I was pinned down. So finally, Isaac lets out his challenge bugle, and that bull goes silent. 
I mean, he doesn't say anything else. And next thing I know, I hear so I got some movement coming from my left, and I see these two cows coming, and they're about to be right in this tiny little meadow that I'm in. And so I draw back, and they are walking right at me. And then I see these this I see horns coming behind it, and here comes this little bull right behind them. And I count the points, and I go, okay, he's got four on both sides. He's got he's five. Legal. On the ground. Let's do it. He's legal. <laughs> And even though I had a bull that I knew was much bigger, just 200 yards away, I will kept ringing in the back of my head as all the people I know that do this and don't get something. <laughs> For and years and years and so, years, too. <laughs> yes. And so here comes this bull. I mean, I my shot was eight yards. So I've been, I've been practicing all summer to shoot 50, 60, 70, even 80 <laughs> yards. And <clears throat> I got an eight-yard shot straight on. He was walking. He had no idea I was there. Um but uh, so one, it was great just to be able to have that happen. And then I just go walking back to Isaac, the 30 yards back to our tent. And I said, I just shot a bull like <laughs> this is crazy, <laughs> but uh, we did it. But, <laughs> but that spot I put a lot of emphasis on. And also there was so much country we covered after that, that we did not find elk in. And I think in, in that, and I'm not sure this is specific to anywhere else, but this area of Colorado, but because I've actually only really found more of these spots in this kind of area of Colorado. Um, but I've been able to figure out what it was. I asked myself, why were those elk there? I went to Google earth and I found a lot more. And honestly, I found a lot better. Uh, so we, we have spots that we're planning on going next year that, that I think are, even though I killed a bull in this spot, we're not going back there. I truly believe I have found areas that are even better. Another tool that I, that I think was fantastic or reason why Google earth was great is if I do find some wallows on there, I can scroll through the years and the time frames and see, are those wallows still there? Do they still look active? And that tells me that, that every year during hunting season, even with pressure, there's still elk here. Uh, I've actually, in many spots, I literally have seen elk on Google Earth. Like, so then it's like, well, that's definitely a spot, <laughs> you know. Uh, but so that, that's been a major factor, and, and especially for planning for, for next year, is we're going to be focusing more on these spots, getting there, being much more conservative on our calling, uh, probably honestly treating it more like a mule deer hunt and, and trying to not let them know we're there and and – not try to blow those spots up because I just think the area we were in 90% of the elk were in 10% of the country. And Hmm. so, yeah. Yeah, And it, it, I think, you know, tactics too can be wildly successful in one area, one unit, one state, and could be the absolute wrong thing to do in another area, unit or state. Um, And so it's like, you know, this tactic that guys swear by and that works for them, don't question that at all, but that doesn't mean that that tactic is going to work where you are at if you try that. And so especially if yeah, you, I mean, if you're on the over-the-counter, you know, unit that gets pressured, area that gets pressured, you know, sometimes just shut up, don't call, you know, try and find the elk without it, and then maybe only call once you're, like, truly in the zone if you need to. But, yeah, to to be running ridges, blowing bugles, I mean, you know, there's guys that do it, do it well, and it works, but that doesn't mean it's going to work everywhere. Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we, we wish we would have had more um, tricks in our basket. We kind of focused on just the one strategy last year. So this next year we're going to be uh, – we're still going to have that strategy, the, you know, more Corey Jackson style. We still love that. It looks like the funnest elk hunting ever. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> we're going to be trying some others too. And uh, – um, and just being having more tricks in our bag for yeah. next year. Awesome. Nice. Right. So this is, you know, there's listeners out there who uh, I'm sure are getting ready to go on their first hunt and you've made them incredibly excited. There's listeners who've been on maybe one or two or handful of hunts and you've made them incredibly angry <laughs> by going on your first elk, uh, on your first elk yeah. hunt and then shooting, you know, an elk 30 yards away from your tent. But, you know, you even mentioned to me that one of your biggest fears before this hunt and with doing all the work, spending the money, driving the distance, 
leaving the wife, leaving the newborn, was to do all that and not find elk. And I know this is, you know, kind of a, a theoretical to say because it's not the way it happened, but if you would have done this trip and, you know, been through the hell night and some of the other things that you went through and dealt with the crappy gear and didn't shoot an elk, do you think you would be as hooked as you are now still and want to go back? Do you think it would be worth it? I guess for, you know, for listeners who are out there who are like, is this, is this worth it? What, what's your thoughts? I think if, if, um, even if I didn't, uh, kill a bull, um, just seeing the elk, that was my goal. I said that, that I felt confident enough in my hunting abilities, even though I've never done this type of hunting before, I, uh, just being adversed in the woods and, and, and a bow archery hunting and things that if I could just hear some bugles, if, a, if an elk would just tell me where it is, or if I could see one, then I feel like I, I could do okay. So if I wouldn't have seen one, then yeah, I, I would be seriously questioning, was this worth all the stress in our lives for uh, putting money into this instead of other places, putting all this time, putting my wife through a week and a half of, of just her being with a not sleeping baby. Uh, you know, it, that would have been a lot tougher, but I'm not sure exactly why, but I'm assuming that that whole idea of, of am I going to find elk is what, makes us new hunters, new Western hunters, the most nervous. I mean, it kept me up at night. I'd be sitting there. I'd tell Isaac, Hey, I, I, I'm really excited about this spot. And here's why. But as soon as I'd hang up on the phone with him before the hunt, I would say, but gosh, I hope it, it's really what I think it is. Uh, or any of these other spots for that matter, what I think it is. Cause if we do all of this and I don't even see an elk, cause I heard so many horror stories of these guys doing that, that, yeah, it could have affected my want to do it again. I don't think killing an elk, though, makes me want to go again. Uh, but if I went the whole week without seeing one, it definitely could have affected um, my desire to do it again. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah. Awesome. Perfect. Well, we're coming up on time. Is there anything sticking out that you would want, you know, somebody else who was in your shoes a year ago to hear? Um, from your experience or anything that we didn't cover? I mean, we covered a lot and I think a ton that's incredibly helpful, but did we, did we sort of miss anything that you want to cover before we wrap this one up? I don't think so. Uh, I think most importantly is just is, is prepare and prepare more. And if, if you're not, if whatever you're doing to prepare isn't, uh, killing you, (laughs) then it may not be (laughs) enough as (laughs) as your hunt will, you know, and, and, uh, <laughs> try to be, especially if you're like us, and, and this is a very foreign thing. Even though you're excited about it, going into the mountains at high elevation, hunting an animal you've hardly been around is very foreign. Be ready to be uncomfortable and out of place. Uh, be ready to have your plans stomped on, and you get a feeling like, oh, gosh, like I just I don't know what to do now. Uh, my whole plans are, are thrown out the window. Uh, just be ready for that. And be ready to have your plan B and C close by and, and stick to them. Don't be discouraged. Um, and just know that it is, it is absolutely doable. Um, we did it. And I, I mean, maybe uh, an experienced hunter might be looking at me and saying, you know, don't be ridiculous, but I can't even tell you how confident I am going into next year. And that's not because I killed a bull, but it's Isaac is up first next year. I'm so gung ho for getting him a bull and I got, I've done all this research, done even more work. Uh, and we really think it's going to happen. Uh, l- l- if luck's on our side and, but this is one of the greatest experiences and the hardest experiences I've ever been through. And it was <laughs> fantastic. So everybody should definitely try it. Yeah. Very rewarding. I think all the work, all the blood, sweat and tears and everything that, was put into it all and just thankfully you know we we come back with the prize and it just i mean every time i take a bite of that meat you know at dinner with the family i mean it's just that much better (laughs) Mm -hmm. i love your guys's uh, confidence going into next year because i think it's such an important aspect that's overlooked is that confidence is just gonna 
you know, you're just going to hunt better. You're going to hunt smarter. And when things do get tough, your mental attitude is going to be a lot better about the situation and, right. and you'll keep at it and you're, you're going to end up being tagged out. Yep. 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 Yeah. That's awesome. Well, Matt, Isaac, we're, we're, uh, proud of you. Can't wait to hear how it happens, uh, next year for you. And thank you so much for joining us tonight. Yeah. Thank you. We love sharing our experience. So, Thank you for listening to the Hunt Pack Country podcast. To access the show notes for this episode and subscribe to future episodes, please visit exomountaingear.com forward slash podcast. We value your feedback and would love to hear about any questions, topics, suggestions, or comments you have. Our email address is podcast at exomountaingear.com. Additionally, if you're enjoying the show, please consider leaving us a review on iTunes. By doing so, you will be entered into our next Exo Mountain Gear swag giveaway. We look forward to the next episode and hope you do as well.